in the near future. So speaking on Sustainable Island State Agenda as well as the UN Environment Assembly that you recently participated in and you were elected to serve on the Bureau of the next uh, United Nations Environment Assembly. So we want to know what does this mean for St. Casinius, how does it benefit us, and you know anything else that you would like to share on that. So let's begin on the UN Environment, of, uh, Environment Assembly. Go ahead. So tell us about how does this impact St. Kitts and Nevis? What does it mean for St. Kitts and Nevis? Right. Thank you for the questions. And while I'll begin where you suggested, I just want to say I recently, just three minutes ago, left the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College, okay. where in collaboration with the college and several partners led by Dr. Wayne Archibald, the mm -hmm. government of St. Kitts along with CFBC launched the, Green, um, the Caribbean Center of Excellence in Research, Innovation and Workforce Training. And that's training in green technology, solar panels, EV training. And I just needed to give that a big shout out and congratulations because this would be the largest um, training opportunity in the region mm -hmm. for EVs, um, solar energy, solar power, solar panels. And it's a huge thing and it speaks well for um, our move towards a sustainable island state. And right. it also is connected with what we were lobbying for in um, at UNEA 6 in Kenya and what we are pushing for uh, generally as it relates to um, partnerships, mm -hmm. education, and sustainability. Mm -hmm. I was just about to ask you, what does this mean for our sustainable island state agenda? And <laughs> you yes. have touched on that, you know? Uh, but that is really good. Definitely, I'll take some time out to look at that. So looking at the environment, uh, UN Assembly, what does this mean for St. Kitts and Nevis? And how do we stand to benefit? Right, so thank you for that question. So yes, UNEA 6, um, the General Assembly happens every, it's the Environment um, Assembly, mm -hmm. and it happens every two years, and it happened in Kenya this year, and it will happen in Kenya again, where, where the campus is located. And St. Kitts and Nevis was fortunate. Uh, we had the regional support, Latin America and the Caribbean, to be nominated to be part of the UNEA 7 Bureau. And St. Kitts and Nevis is nominated, to, was nominated, and elected to serve un, um, unchallenged, mm -hmm. um, to serve as the rapporteur for UNEA 7 and being part of the Bureau, the presidency, we govern, the Bureau of the presidency governs the UNEA assembly, the resolutions, the discussions, the procedures, and what it means for St. Kitts outside of the prominence of being an, and um, serving on the presidency of an international body. It also means that you're part of the decision making. Mm -hmm. You're part of the convening of the General Assembly where all decisions governing our planet, um, solving the triple planetary crisis happens at UNEA and then transfer to other um, uh, assemblies such as when we go to climate cop or biodiversity cop or other general assemblies the discussions coming out of UNEA leads the way for the next two years and that St. Kitts and Nevis the smallest um, nation in the Western Hemisphere gets to sit on such a prestigious presidency it means a lot and it also means that we're part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's most important to small island developing states. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We know that the uh, triple planetary crisis it speaks to climate change. It also speaks to pollution and biodiversity. In conversation with people in St. Kitts and Nevis, they would usually express um, their views and opinions in terms of us keeping St. Kitts and Nevis clean, we know that as a small island developing state and the challenges we face with climate change, oftentimes people call for more to be done. Here is it no, I would say more is being done. Your thoughts? Right. So 
I, I would like to meet the people who are calling for more because we have so much more that we want right. to offer. And I do know that there are also calls for tempering what we do as a small island state and recognizing that we can't take on every single global initiative. Yeah. However, to that I'll say that St. Kitts and Nevis, I'm part of you know sitting on the um, bureau or participating in the sessions and representing SIDS as one of the um, focal areas for St. Kitts and Nevis is that we have the opportunity to share what's important to St. Kitts and Nevis and what needs to be contextualized to our realities. So, more. The more really begins with the behavioral change here and the partnerships here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay. And as a ministry, we're happy to share what can be done and we're happy to lobby internationally and regionally for decisions to, to reflect our unique needs but we know that it's about the on the ground work ground truthing what environmental concept biodiversity conservation pollu responding to pollution limiting plastic pollution and also transitioning to a sustainable island state means for every single petition and vision and i've been saying quite often it really boils down to the bread and butter issues of the planet like yes. can you save the planet while saving yourselves right. what is the point of saving the planet if you can't feed yourself is what i mean but you have to save the planet to feed yourself so it's really getting that narrative connected with petitions with their pockets and then getting the behavior change mm -hmm. regarding the sustainable development goals we know that there are 17. So looking at the sustainable development goals, the UN Environment Assembly and our sustainable island state agenda, are there areas that we are, uh, while we want to achieve all 17 of course, are there areas that we are focusing on trying our best to, to get some level of, get some work done basically? Right, so that's a great question, and I am going to take this opportunity to highlight the key players here. Now, um, Cosbert Woods, the resident coordinator for um, the UN resident coordinator, has been our glue, really, in getting ministries to focus on their respective goals and understand okay. how the goals link to everything that we do. And in the Ministry of Sustainable Development, that's where we have the um, um, the work of the SDGs, the, the establishment in the future of a sustainable development coordinating committee, which brings together lead technical persons to focus and zone, hone in on the SDGs. Now, what we've done with CESA is align our seven pillars of transformation to the SDGs and the all SDGs fit into one of the seven pillars and it's simply because we want to amplify the SDGs. We, we, we're not creating anything else. When it comes to energy conservation, it's directly linked mm -hmm. to clean energy, which is an SDG goal. When it comes to food security, when it comes to um, circularity, all of them are linked to goals for the 2030 development agenda. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note that it's these critical partnerships within ministries and then outside of government, which will allow us to attain the SDGs. Now, when we did our voluntary national review last year, which was led by the Minister of Energy, that was the first time St. Kitts and Nevis presented its voluntary national review, which is really a check, a checkup. Uh, where are you with your SDGs? And we are leading the region when it comes to goals, focus on people, your quality of life, your security, your participation in democracy, and and your development, and you've seen that now with the recent release of our position as leading the Caribbean right. in the HDI. Right. And I mean, what does that mean? We're we're number one for HDI. Well, it means that we're number one in things that relate to human development, mm -hmm. the social services, the social protection, the systems, the institutions that protect the most vulnerable. Saint Kitts and Nevis leads the region, and remember that there are countries in the region whose GDP per capita doubles ours and who where people are paid in the US, the Bahamas, the Cayman, Barbados. And we are leading, which means that we are doing something correct when right. it comes to people. In relation to goals that speak to the planet, which, you know, pollution, climate change, there's very little that we can do as a small island where we do not contribute the most to 
mm-hmm. environmental change. And that's why it's important for us to check all the boxes to make sure we are resilient while other nations continue to harm the planet. And where we cause tra- drama and challenges, we also do corrective action. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, doing work outside of government and um, with regards to the Sustainable Island State Agenda and the SDGs. Uh, can you speak to work that you have been doing in terms of meeting with private sector groups and organizations to ensure that they are also on board? Yes. Thanks for that question. You know, just last week, our technical team at the Ministry of Environment, we were invited to the Rotary Club um, to be a lunch. And that that was a welcome invitation. I hope every single NGO invites the ministry to have a sit down mm-hmm. with them at your meeting, at your lunch, anything. And the rapport was so excellent because there's there are ideas in the private sector that we just cannot conceptualize and right. even if we could, we cannot implement and execute because government doesn't have the same levers as the private sector. So that conversation, while it was around um, plastics, also included the Sustainable Island State Agenda. And our lead consultant, Professor Donovan Campbell, who is with the University of the West Indies, that's another partnership in the academic um, sphere that we're lobbying and, and, and really trying to solidify, was there to present what does sustainability mean to St. Kitts and Nevis, but more importantly, what does it mean to the private sector? What does it mean to civil service officers? organizations and how can you partner and the ideas are just excellent it's mm-hmm. public private partnerships are what will take us from where we are to where we need to be in environmental conservation mm-hmm. and we understand in, in, in any area of development um, there has to be a partnership between the government and the private sector for things to work it is 15 minutes past the 11 o'clock hour you're listening to the edge here on ZIZ radio we'll take a break And when we come back, we'll continue the conversation. Stay tuned. Get ready for the 2024 edition of the Agricultural Open Day. Day. Going down on Thursday 25th and Friday 26th April at the Royal Bastion Valley National Park next to the National Heroes Park. Action time from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Thursday and 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Friday. Admission for all $5. School children in uniform getting absolutely free. Fresh food, local drinks, grilled seafood, barbecue chicken, black pudding, goat water, and the crowd favorite, finger licking tree mutton. <laughs> Sign up for the watermelon eating competition, roast cart eating competition, horseback riding, take a ride on the mechanical bull, lots of games and cultural performances, musical entertainment by DJ Shaggy, Hellfire International, EK, The Real Right, and The Sugar Bed, New Vibes International. See you at the Agriculture Open Day, April 25th and 26 at the Bastia Royal Valley National Park. Don't, don't you, don't. you miss it! Hello and welcome back to The Edge here on ZIZ Radio 96.1 FM. I'm Devon Cornelius and thank you for joining me in the program for today. If you are just tuning in, joining me in studio is Senator the Honorable Dr. Joyle Clark, and she's the Minister with Responsibility for Sustainable Development, Environment, Climate Action, and Constituency Empowerment. And today we are focusing on the Sustainable Island State Agenda and what St. Kitts and Nevis has been doing to contribute to this locally, regionally, and internationally. If you joined us earlier, you would uh, hear that the minister spoke on a number of things that we've been doing and uh, St. Kitts and Nevis has been on the international stage and I would say shining on the international stage and being a part of the decision making. So let's get back to our conversation. In terms of just before we went for the break, you mentioned that we don't contribute much to the climate crisis what can we do 
Seke Senevis as a small island developing state to influence the actions or decisions of those larger countries in terms of what they contribute to the climate crisis? Right, and that's an excellent question. And I want to phrase that in the context of some persons or some who may think that um, St. Kitts and Nevis shouldn't take on international decisions wholesale. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that part of negotiations and lobbying, and I'll say this, that when you end up at some of these conferences, there are lobbyists and, and persons who are lobbying if, we, if you're at Climate Cop and we're pushing as a government for or as a region for um, 1.5, there are thousands of lobbies who are pushing for, let's continue to use fossil fuels. So part of changing the decisions is actually having negotiators in the room. You have to be present to influence decision making. Mm -hmm. You have to train. Our Climate Action Unit, the director, travels, trains, participates, lobbies all year round and then at the end of the year the Prime Minister leads a delegation to COP to push the agenda. You have to show up with your champion voices. So it's not always where technical many technical persons can then be part of the high level negotiations. You have to show the action on the ground. But when you show up for example, at UNEA 7, UNEA 6, we had to present ourselves not just as St. Kitts and Nevis, but as SIDS, as small island developing states. Right. And then you rally together and you present the language that's best fitting for you. I'll tell you about the 15 resolutions that were passed. Um, our chief technical negotiator sat in the resolution sessions and you can sit there for hours debating whether it should be we wholeheartedly welcome or we expect versus we would like and and you know the english language as a journalist um devon the language determines the ambition and determines the action yes so St. Kitts and Nevis has to show up, but there are good partnerships that are out there and available for us, and that's where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs becomes so critical, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs has really has really um, bolstered the action of and, um, the Ministry of Sustainable Development with the, the bilateral partnerships and conversations that precede us even participating in some of the sessions. Also, for example, our ministry is set to participate in our Oceans 10, which is a huge global conversation on oceans, on the marine um, marine resources and the blue economy. And this is a joint participation by the Ministry of Marine Resources and Ministry of Environment, facilitated through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are going um, to speak about what matters to small island developing states, right. to small coastal islands or large ocean states like St. Kitts and Nevis. So to get them to change their ways, we definitely have to be part of the conversation and we have to present ourselves not just as islands, but as SIDS, 150 strong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, I know you would agree with me when I say, and when people say that climate change is real, mm -hmm. and we, we, we can't continue to rely on just the larger countries to represent us at the or on the international stage. Small countries like St. Kitts and Nevis must be represented. And I like you mentioned the, the fact that we must make our presence known so that the larger countries are aware that we are supporting, we are interested in contributing to the changes being at the decision-making table and ensuring that it's not just words, it's not just talk, but there is real action. So still looking at the sustainable island state agenda, we want to talk now about what we've been doing. Um, we've touched on it briefly, but what we've been doing here in St. Kitts and Nevis with regards to the sustainable island state agenda and how are we going to get there? Right. Go ahead. Great question. I love that question. <laughs> what are we doing and how are we going to get there? And I can answer it very simply. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're talking to everyone. How are we going to get there? Together. The end. Next question. <laughs> but I'm not. In politics, you have to go on until your toes stop, right? Yeah. So thank you for the opportunity to explain. Now, two years ago, well, just about 18 months ago, when our throne speech presented our ambition to become a sustainable island state, then our budget 
our first budget was the journey towards sustainability and last year's budget was about the transformation mm -hmm. very strategic nothing that is not happenstance we are deliberately and intentionally moving strategically towards sustainability but while we presented the vision of sustainability as a government, which isn't anything that is brand new because we've been talking about the sustainable development goals for years. Right. What was new is that the champion of sustainability became the highest voice in the nation, which is the prime minister, which supported the cause of the Ministry of Environment, which, which needed that boost. Mm -hmm. Additionally, Every ministry has taken on the mandate of sustainability through the sustainable development goals. So whether it's the Venture Deeper campaign from the Ministry of Tourism, it's a 25 by 25 agenda for food security with the Ministry of Agriculture, it's water transition, water security with the Ministry of Water um, Services, it's energy trans transition with renewable energy with the Ministry of Energy, it's the EV policy that's being developed by that ministry every single ministry is finance presenting a budget that speaks to sustainability and longevity it's alterations in every single sector of government that's speaking to sustainability we champion the vision and we're making structural changes structural changes with the support of our UN um, resident coordinator Cosbert Woods and no, we're saying to the people, we have a vision. We are just branding and amplifying sustainability through the vision to become a sustainable island state premised on climate resilience. We, de develop, we established the Department of Climate Action, which was a big thing. It seems like nothing here. But to, pro to give climate action such prominence means you're very serious about the climate resilience agenda. We recognize that government can't do it all. We had national consultations last year before the budget. Now we're having ongoing consultations. We've had conversations within the ministry. We've had conversations with our permanent secretaries because the government must first understand its agenda before you could present it to the people. Right. So there has been buy-in across government. We're now twinning this vision to become a sustainable island state with the National Development Planning Framework 2040. And this is housed in the Ministry of Economic Development. And this framework tells every single ministry what you need to do to become sustainable by 2040. We have the national develop, um, nationally determined contributions, which tells us our ambition is to reduce fossil fuel use by 60% by 2040. Mm -hmm. Hence, the Ministry of Energy is aggressively pushing geothermal right. and EV. So you see how everything is aligned? Mm -hmm. Now the conversation has to be transitioned to the private sector and the public, the general public. That's why I'm here this morning. But that's where the partnership with the University of, West, of the West Indies coming to play we want to talk with the public and we've set out a very aggressive agenda for one year of consultations mm -hmm. we've already um, gotten funding for sustainable island states through the green climate fund as well as through um, OSF which is open society foundation around climate justice so Devon while we talk we are bringing in the funding to talk even more. Mm -hmm. We're aligning our projects with um, the Jeff Small Grants program around sustainability and climate and community groups. So we are now ready to talk to the nation. So this is an open invitation to the ministries, to the NGOs, the civil societies, the churches, the clubs, the schools. We are ready to talk. I think you already remember in Dr. Clark. I was just about to ask you about grant funding in terms of the small grants program, the green climate uh, fund, because the projects that we would want to pursue in St. Kitts and Nevis, of course, you can't just rely on government funding and state resources. You have to look at grant funding. Uh, how, how has that been? How has the response been in terms of getting grant funding for these projects? So our first grant funding, our first offer was after uh, COP28 mm -hmm. when the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Premier of Nevis, mm -hmm. the Minister of Energy and myself 
as well as the, pres the, the president of the CDB and CQI. So how many stakeholders sat in our session? Yes. <laughs> and we present, and the University of the West Indies and young people from St. Kitts and Nevis. Mm -hmm. And we presented a top-notch session at COP28. And it was from that session that um, OSF, which was there um, in person in our audience, said we really wanted to work with St. Kitts and Nevis through the University of the West Indies. Can you please apply for this grant? Mm -hmm. And um, our lead consultant did, and he just returned the news the other day that, yeah, we got our first grant funding to document what's happening, to do the research and the consultations and create policy briefs. And then, um, speaking with our NDA, that's the um, National Designated Authority, the Ministry of Sustainable Development, the Department of PSIP, I made sure to say that. So persons who want to think about their green climate projects, that's where you go. We said, you know, we really would like Sustainable Island State on the GCF agenda. And of course, you have to write the proposals. And then I got the news that, yes, in partnership with other projects, we are going to have funding for that. And it continues because we do have to write the grants to get the funds. But sometimes, most times, we have to show up in the spaces where they are offered mm -hmm. to lobby for why St. Kitts and Nevis needs more money. I said, it's one last thing last year, we were also able to access more funding from the Jeff program through the lobbying and leadership of um, Laverne Queeley, who was then the Jeff National Focal Point. Okay. And that was so critical because we were basically telling the world, small island developing states, we need more money. Mm -hmm. and, and it cannot be equal. And, and, and for that, she, as chair of the caucus then, she did such an excellent job. We have more money to do more sustainability, sustainable island state um, development mm -hmm. projects. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Clark. It is 11.30 and you're listening to the Edge here on ZIZ Radio, 96.1 FM. For those of you who are just tuning in, joining me in studio today is Senator the Honorable Dr. Joyle Clark, and she's the Minister Responsible for Sustainable Development, Environment and Climate Action and Constituency Empowerment. And we've been speaking on topics surrounding her ministry. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue the conversation. Stay tuned. future is unknown. Protect your life, your family, and your valuables from unforeseen circumstances. Let National Caribbean Insurance give you the peace of mind that you so deserve. At NCI, we offer a suite of affordable insurance plans that can be tailored to ease your financial burden. We aim to deliver exceptional products to satisfy all your insurance needs. Where the life health, motor or property insurance, NCI has the right solution for you. Our friendly and knowledgeable sales professionals are ready and able to assist you. Let National Caribbean Insurance Company Limited help you to prepare for the unexpected. We serve, we protect, we satisfy. That's NCI. Get ready, St. Kitts and Nevis, for the first annual Jesus in the City Parade and Festival on Saturday, May 18th, 2024 at the Warner Park Stadium. Celebrate love for God and love for people throughout the city with festive floats, live gospel bands, choirs, costumes, banners, and paraders filling the streets of downtown Bastyr with praise and worship. The only festivities kick off at 11 a.m. with a parade leaving Warner Park Stadium at 12 noon, moving along city streets and returning to the stadium for a grand gospel concert celebration. Enjoy music featuring special international guest artists, local bands, food and festivities for the whole family. Come lift up the name of Jesus in the city on Saturday, May 18th, 2024. To register your church, enter a float, secure a vendor booth, or to become a sponsor, visit JesusInTheCity.com or call 662-8911.
Welcome back to the Edgians at IZ Radio, 96.1 FM. I'm Devon Cornelius. It's 11.32. We wrap up this conversation just before noon for the ZIZ Midday Newscast. We're speaking all things sustainable development, environment, climate action, and Dr. Clark is here to um, join in the conversation. So just before we uh, came back we were talking about sustainable cities and human settlement and i have an issue with our cities bastia and charleston but in this case uh, bastia where it's not giving sustainable it's not giving sustainable um what what can be done or the work that has been put in before how does that support the move to a sustainable city? I don't know how you could <laughs> help me with that. Okay, I can. It's gonna be um, it's gonna be a long answer, but I can. I'll, I'll make it as that, short as possible. That, that's okay. Safe to say, I get a, um, your fears fears can be allayed a little bit because we have what we call the urban resilience plan. Okay. And the urban urban resilience plan, which is spearheaded by the director of the urban development um, department of urban development, which is Mr. Ron Body, mm -hmm. has been an ongoing project about building resilience within. Um, Bastia and uh, Greater Bastia, the urban environment. And this speaks to everything from coastal resilience to ports to our streets, um, drain, drainage to it, structural integrity of buildings. There's also the National Phys Physical Development pa Plan, which is spearheaded by the Director of um, Physical planning, mm -hmm. Mr. J. Faria, and that one also is about to be approved by cabinet, having gone through um, several iterations with professional consultancies on how we designate and zone land use in St. Kitts and Nevis and even in our urban centers. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll say no, and this might might even expedite what, what the Development Control and Planning Board is planning to do in terms of, you know, reviewing its own legislation to ensure that the building codes are also in line with climate resilience building mm -hmm. codes and, and engineering. Now, recently, in partnership with the Stimson Center and the Republic of China and Taiwan, the Taiwan ICDF program, we presented our Corvi assessment. We did that last year. PS, former PS Retton and myself presented those assessment, um, those assessments to the Our Oceans Conference in Panama last year, and that's where we made it very clear that Bastia is one of the most vulnerable coastal cities in the region and we've known this since we were young right we we were told bastia is below sea level yeah. if there is a storm surge bastia floods and you've seen all of the coastal engineering work to protect bastia but what we're realizing now that it has to go way beyond just acknowledging that bastia is below sea level and and greening a city i think when i was at planning the physical development department when i was 18 <laughs> I was 18. We were talking then about um, greening and pedestrianizing Bastia and making okay. sure that Bastia was a green, safe space, which eliminated the car, the pollution and the exhaust from vehicles in the city. Mm -hmm. Then there were conversations about addressing transportation and parking within the city. How do you get people? To understand that you don't have to park in front of National Bank to go to National Bank. You could walk. Mm -hmm. So those were conversations from 20 years ago that wow. we now have to enact. And then there's the issue of abandoned property in Bastia and Greater Bastia. And then there's the issue of we've run out of space. What are we going to do in Bastia? And people don't think about these things mm -hmm. or directly link them to climate resilience, but they are so linked. Now, as we see migration and climate migration becoming an issue, how do we deal with the increase in migrants, the increase in populations from other countries who reside in coastal cities, who are in vulnerable housing? How do we address that problem? How do we incorporate them into the government system? So there is quite a work quite a bit of work to be done um, in Bastia, but I'm proud to say that with the 
UDC, the Urban Development Corporation, the Department of Urban Development, with the end, with the Planning Board, with the Min Department of Physical Planning, that we are working towards creating greater resilience for Bastia. It means that we're going to have to build up, and we may have to leave level one down, and still things mm -hmm. to, uh, to to respond to, mm -hmm. or rather mitigate. Right, right, right. But. Yes, your feelings about is Bastia giving sustainability? Mm -hmm. It's true, but the decisions or the designs to make Bastia give more sustainability, they are there. But that has to be done with every single business owner in Bastia. That has to be supported and that has to be financed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was really happy when you mentioned building codes. Mm -hmm. Because for me, you can't have a sustainable city if there are no building codes. Mm -hmm. And we know in St. Kitts and Nevis, we are susceptible to hurricanes and other natural disasters. And so our buildings must have a good structural integrity. And so definitely there needs to be a focus on that in terms of legislation, funding, and all of that. It's 11.38, and believe it or not, we are running out of time. Uh, we'll open the phone lines and take a few callers before we wrap our conversation for today. You can call us at 465-2555 or 718-577-2916. That is our overseas line. And remember, we are live on ZIZ TV, ZIZ's YouTube uh, channel, and our Facebook page. The phone lines are open now and we are taking your calls. But if you don't have any calls at this particular time, I want to go back to the National Physical Development Plan that you mentioned and the Urban Resilience Plan. And we just came out of, you know, building codes and all of that. But I really think there needs to be uh, uh, a heavy focus on building codes um, for some reason, perhaps because of funding people may not be taking it as seriously until we get to the Until you get a stop order from the ministry yeah. and then you call. And something Why do I have a stop order? <laughs> what does this mean? You, have, you got a stop order because you did something wrong. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. But National Physical Development Plan. Mm -hmm. let, let us um, go into that some more. Um, you mentioned building up right. instead of expanding because truth is... Um, we're running out of space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that is a solution. That is a solution. Yes, and 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 I don't want to preempt what the department would present to the nation, except to okay. say it is now time for us to consider upward um, expansion mm -hmm. and not lateral expansion mm -hmm. because 68 square miles can only go so far and we cannot concretize the concrete the whole country mm -hmm. we cannot build homes on every single square foot of the country because we got to eat right 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 you need green spaces children have to play athletes have to run farms have to grow so there are so many things that are considered when it comes to how do you zone the land use and part of it is a recognition that there are abandoned properties in Greater Bastyr that need to be addressed and and some countries have taken the transformation I mean crazy crazy in a good sense like um, a colleague of mine said to me if you go back to Kingston which I've not been have not been since I graduated I spent too many years there anyways she said, it's different. She said, you know those flats we lived in where it was just one person in a house? They're like multi-story building to accommodate housing. Of course, when you do that, there's a challenge of parking and driving and transport, transport and traffic. One solution leads to another problem, but that's where a holistic view of your country through the National Development Plan could guide you in what makes sense. It, it's not random. Mm -hmm. And I want to use this also, this opportunity also because you mentioned about building codes to plug the Architects Registration Act, which also is another route to sustainability and making sure there's structural and engineering integrity with the construction of buildings. And, and we're going to be presenting this bill. It had its first reading 
we're going to do the second reading very shortly but we're working with our com media partners and i love to say it, our media partners to do serious consultation and engagement to ensure that the changes are understood and to also present to the nation that for St. Kitts and Nevis, we didn't just do this because the rest of the Caribbean and CARICOM has to do it. We tailored our packaging to St. Kitts and the unique realities of our architects and draftsmen here. So the ministry is working on multiple things to really push the sustainability agenda in ways that people wouldn't directly link sustainability to, from your building codes to your um, greeting bar steer to the ports and how what being able to walk in bar steer, less parking and less traffic in bar steer, and of course, how we address abandoned lots mm -hmm. and awesome. create more green spaces. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Dr. Clark. I think we had some callers on the line, we do. Let's hit this call. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Devon. Good morning, how are you? Oh, you're giving God thanks, man. Thank God we made it, you know. Good morning, Miss Clark. Good morning. Yeah, I appreciate, I, I appreciate what you are saying, you know. Now, let's start with Newtown, Seawall. I live in Newtown. I guess you would have seen the erosion with the concrete has been worn out. You know what I'm talking about, right? I am aware. That wall need to be extended up to the fisheries and down Irish Town. These are things that we can do in the short term. Now, this one with the housing, I'm glad you mentioned it because I, for one, have been saying, when we say we are going to build 2,400 houses on the limited amount of land, I think we need to go back to the board and, as you said, multi store with buildings only. I mean, if people have their own land in a certain location. But if we are serious about the sustainable land and all of that, three, four, five, I mean, as you said, you have been to Jamaica, I studied in Jamaica too. And in Barbados, the three and story house, low income houses, you know no longer flat on the ground so you you will have to promote that now you mentioned that we have in the development plan to 2040 hello yes yes oh sorry yes is it available to the public mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. no wait let me finish it hurry uh quickly wrap no, up. i ask a question I would like to, you know, as an economist and all that, I would like to get... Well, Dr. Clark, I'll always respond while um, the caller is off. Yeah, but she has to get the question first. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and pose the question. So, is it accessible to the public? All right, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'll start first with the NDPF. So the 2040, it takes us to 20, 2037, 2040. The executive summary will be presented to the public by the Ministry of Economic Development very shortly. And of course, everyone can read. There'll be even, they, they did their consultations ahead of finalizing this document on St. Kate Sand and Nevis and with every single ministry okay. and every single um, stakeholder. And I'll also respond to the the issue of the I'll get to the housing just now. The issue of the bayfront, mm -hmm. as I yes. mentioned, with our carvey assessment, we real coastal vulnerability indicator. We realize that urban coastal Bastia is one of the most vulnerable regions in mm -hmm. places in the region. I'll be happy to say that we are also that approaching the point? adaptation fund for um, financial support not to address issues around. Um, Bastia Bayfront, as well as the um, the Koi region, straight the the yeah, beach and region, yes. right? And, and around then. Fort Lands, I'll be happy to say that one of the main cabinet capital projects with the Ministry of Public Works is the Fort Land um, engineering or um, support project. So they are included in our local budgets, which is critical for international funding. And we're working with five C's. Um, to access funding from the adaptation fund to deal with the Bay Road as yeah, well man. as with because the water coming from George Street, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, the housing. Right, yes, so we do support upward I'll construction. Mm -hmm. Alright, Connor, thank you for your contribution to the program. Let's head back to the phone lines and we'll take some more calls. Let's take this call. 
Hi, good morning. Morning, um, Minister. Good morning. Nah, how are you doing? Wonderful. Okay, got it. Um, in terms of, and I, I like the discussion, you know, as um, I travel and I understand. Um, in terms of um, in Bastia, right? In terms of making it healthy, uh, make it much more cleaner. You said, or uh, you are, there are plans in restricting the amount of vehicle. But um, I'm not hearing what are the plans for parking. You know, I know that there are some land, uh, some houses that are abandoned. You know, maybe some of those can be considered used for parking, and you could have a two three storage floor for parking. Because I agree, you shouldn't have to park right in front of the bank to go in the bank. You know, but where are you going to park? So in the planning process, I want to hear if there's any area, you know, close into Bastia, right? I'm not sure uh, if the government plan to even tap into part of Port Zante, you know, and use it as a parking. So right. that's much I, I, I'm, I'm looking to hear. All right, Claire, thank you. Dr. All right, Claire. so thank you for that question. And I'm happy that I didn't, for the caller, go into what the solutions are because, as I said before, solutions mm. don't have to come from the government, but not that we don't have solutions. Right. And I want to make sure I'm very clear when I said the conversation around restricting traffic flow in Bastia happened when I was 18 mm -hmm. and continued up to the last 10 years how to reduce vehicular traffic in Bastia. And you've seen it with the traffic department. The traffic lights, the control flow, the limited parking on streets, the increased yellow lines, all part of the desire to have less traffic in Bastyr. And of course, in everything that we do, there are groups of population that have of, of the population that have to be considered. Uh, persons living with disability, the elderly, persons who have to be in Bastyr, who have to pack in front of National Bank. Those are the persons we have to prioritize. Not young, strong people like us who should really walk. <laughs> are really just right. carpool into Bastyr. And of course, there are many properties around Bastyr that have to be considered. I think I can recall even probably some years ago, there was a conversation of, of constructing a multi-story parking. Right, now, right. these are private sector options that do not have to come from the, the government. Mm -hmm. These are investment options that you can make money from deciding that you want to partner with the government to provide traffic um, parking solutions. Mm -hmm. So everything won't come from us. I thank you for that, Carla. Mm -hmm. Let's head back to the phone lines and we'll take some more calls. Hello, Carla, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello, Carla, good morning, you're on the air. We're not getting that call. Let's take this one. Hello, Carla, good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, you're on the air. Good Go morning. ahead. What's your good question? Good morning, Honorable Minister, and good morning to the host, dear. Yes, good morning. And don't forget the engineer. Good morning. Okay. Um, to eliminate traffic hazard in Bastia, Madam Minister, it's an easy and simple solution. Everything we are doing, we are talking about Bastia. We, we, Bastia is clustered like sardine in a tin. It is time now we, we use the expansion that we have. And madam, the expansion that we have is these areas that we call projects. The government have a policy that they are not allowing um, people to do business on these projects. That, that, that idea is over 100 years old. We need to get rid of that. Now we are developing these projects that we call housing projects. But if you check, people are sneaking business on them and it's not supposed to. These should be expansion of that here. We develop them into towns and let, let's call that here the city where we would have um, businesses being created on these projects where we, we would have people going to work on these projects would be eliminate a lot of the traffic and the cluster sardine tin that we have in Basti and we're still trying to run more sardine in the tin. It All can't right. happen, ma'am. The All expansion right. is out on these projects, having businesses being created, create job opportunities and eliminate the traffic woes we have in Basti. And also, 
we can for that here, the Bay Road which you're talking about, why don't the government now start making an offer to all these people who have all these abandoned properties that the government will buy them off the hand and the government can develop the Bay Road and not only that, the marina need expanding down in Irish Town. All right, Colin, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Dr. Okay, so very quickly, so thank you for that. You see why I tell you public consultation is very important because mm -hmm. people have the ideas, ideas even. Yes. Um, so we have to link them to what's actually happening. So with the aban the Attorney General approached the Ministry of Environment about mm -hmm. the abandoned properties, abandoned lots act or park beautification act, which would encourage persons to, to, to take care of their property. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, the Development Control and Planning Board is working aggressively towards options for dealing with abandoned lots because abandoned lots do belong to someone, right. even if it's tied up in which sister, cousin, <laughs> auntie really supposed to get it and who lived there the longest. Right, but right. there are a lot of legal matters that we have to yes. go through. So we're going to be encouraging um, alternative behavior with the adjustments in the legislation and the policy. In relation to decentralizing activities from urban Bastia, and we're seeing that happen, we never thought that government institutions could end up over in Connery or could end up over Lime Keel uh, away from Church Street. Right, but right, it is right. happening now, and I'm happy to say even the Ministry of Sustainable Development is actively working towards moving a lot of the um, institutions outside of Bastia. Bastia. And finally, that is why the urban resilience plan is so critical, but it's not just a focus on Bastia. It's Bastia, Greater Bastia, and urban centers like Kayon and Sandy Point and St. Peter's, making sure that services are available similar to what's in Bastia. The last, last thing, Devon. Go ahead. <laughs> the Development Control and Planning Act governs what happens on each um, housing development. So there are housing developments which allow for corner shops, green spaces, and, um, but what happens, people must follow the rules and adhere to the legislation, and people must respect each other because if you, if you bought property and built a house and your covenant says no, no shop, no, no zinc fence, no nothing, it's gonna be, um, very hard for you as a homeowner to accept that somebody just comes and set up a shop. But when there is room in the um, development for that, we allow it. So mm -hmm. we just work together and you'll get the right information. So I take the caller's suggestions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We are out of time. It is 11.55. We're going to have to wrap up our conversation for the midday newscast. Uh, Dr. Clark, do you have anything else quickly you'd like to share with the audience? Yes, I want to say thank you to the audience for the questions and please, Devon, invite us back. We're going to send a media package to all social media influencers, all media houses, all interviewers, all vloggers, bloggers, and podcast operators mm -hmm. with all of our changes in environmental sustainability and conservation so the right message is delivered and not a confusing uh, mix-up <laughs> of what really is happening in environment thank you all right thank you so much for joining me in the program for today if you tuned in late you're listening to senator the honorable dr joy clark minister responsible for sustainable development environment and climate action and we were speaking on topics surrounding her ministry in terms of what sinka sinivis has been doing on the local regional and international stage uh, regarding the un environment assembly the sustainable island state agenda until next time, you guys, stay safe. Continue to enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. Have a good one. Bye-bye.